Professor Hyatt, uh, I know that you became a social worker uh, at a much later stage of life than many of us. Uh, would you care to tell us about that experience and how you uh, got involved in the field of social work? Well, I kind of backed into it, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I am, as you know, a writer, and I do the columns for the Cal News for social work. I came to get some research done, and I spoke to a man who ran a very large program for addicted people in New York that was connected to a college there. and. Uh, I wanted him to tell me certain things about the families because my focus was on the families and the heroine in that book was a woman who had died. She really wasn't the heroine, I should say she was the central character because the premise of the book was a mystery. Here was a family that had been profoundly affected by alcoholism, and the mother had passed away of acute alcoholism, and yet, in many ways, she remained in the family system, which I discovered through my research was classic. It, it just happens all the time. And I really was researching the impact of on the families, and what I wound up writing was a book which later became a textbook for my students. It was a novelized case history. It was my master's thesis. And the way that I introduced the idea was to have a woman marry a man who was widowed uh, and begin to take care of the family. And her background had been in a completely uh, different milieu where there was no drinking, no drug addiction, or any part of such a thing. And it was intriguing to me to continue to study this. And basically what I was doing was recreating the whole family systems theory, but I didn't know it at the time. But this man, Dr. Carl Berg, spotted it instantly and decided I needed a, a degree in social work if I wanted anybody to take this book seriously. Now remember it was a novel. It was not it was not a novelized case history at that point. And then I realized I'd better do some studying, more studying. I wasn't just telling a story about one family. I was telling a story about many families. And so I began to do things like going to Al-Anon and going to AA meetings. And uh, I actually began to learn that this story was a story of many families. And so I decided to put them all together. And when I did it as my master's thesis, and I told you that there were 300 people applying to get into the master's programs, the master's programs are impacted and I was positive they wouldn't bother with me, even though I had been doing social work in a very funny way. My husband did not want me to work because I had to travel the world with him. We were working in the interfaith field, in civil rights, in fair housing. Uh, we wanted people to get an equal shake. And I worked for the conference between 1964 and 19... Um, 60, no, it was, yes, yeah, 69 is when I left. That was a four-year period? About four to five years, yeah. That's right. And uh, I had, wasn't allowed to take a normal job. And so what I did was I knew that all, all social work that's done requires something which is the milk of m mother's milk of politics, but it is also the mother's milk of any kind of social work enterprise, whether you're taking care of abused children, uh, uh, domestic violence, you name it, they all need money. And many of these small organizations could not afford an experienced fundraiser. My undergraduate degree is in development, if you please, <laughs> and the history of philanthropy. <laughs> and so what I did was I established an office in my home. 
my husband said I could do anything I wanted except take a job. I could, he said, you remember three things, my dear. You are the mother of my children. You are my hostess all over the world. And uh, I need you when I travel. I couldn't get a job with the conference in those days. You couldn't work if you were the president's wife. And I was a trained uh, as a director. And so here was the compromise. I would have my office in my home, and I would work for these small organizations. Westchester Community College was one of my, one of my clients, and a, a group of nuns who took care of abused children right off the campus in a small convent, Protestant nuns. They were a client. You name the kind of organization. It had to be small, couldn't afford a regular development person. And so those people were my clients. And then I, I was sent um, a young woman from the uh, university uh, in Westchester who was going got back for her to finish her education. And uh, she and I became eventually partners in this enterprise. And I taught her everything I knew, but I did it because I wanted to be able to do what David wanted me to do and still keep my hand in. We're going to have to let that ring. Uh, in any case, to keep my hand in uh, as, as a professional woman, which I had always been. And so this was the compromise. And I put that into my resume when I came to San Francisco State to be admitted. And apparently, they thought I had enough social work background based on that to let me in uh, into this master's program. And of course, it was a big shock. Hi, Lily, this is Marion. I just wanted to tell you it was a very successful evening last night. I have to stop. Your speech was, was like You'll, you'll have to edit this. I'm sorry, dear. I'm going to keep it. <laughs> it's a keeper. Darling, that woman signed a contract. May I digress, please? This is very important. Marion and I have become, uh, we're joined at the hip. She walked in at one time. Um, CCRCs did have an age limit. When I came, it was 84. Marion is married to a man of 92, was married to a man of 92. And she signed a contract without realizing there was an exclusion clause in there. This man of 92, who paid full freight because he was admitted here, and it is not cheap for a couple. It's a half of a million dollars. And she had, I, I asked to see her contract because she was bewildered because he was being refused health care, which is the primary reason you buy these contracts. You buy in to get health care. They had excluded him from any health care. He could not use the area for physical rehabilitation that we have, and I'll get into outsourcing later, and he could not use our health center, but he had paid, as I did and everyone else here did, and pays a full fee for the monthly care fee, but they put that exclusion in, and if the five years passes, he will be either dead or very old, and if, the, if he outlives that five years, they will give him care, which I think is a very interesting way to run a railroad. And this was, I read this and I said to Marion, did you show this to a lawyer? And she said, no, I didn't. And I said, did you see this? She said, what is it? Now these are very intelligent people. Nobody who moves in here is poor, but they are uninformed. And Marion, 
actually had signed that contract, and Gordon, who is a very sharp, he's got all his marbles. Yes, he's sitting in a wheelchair. Yes, he has physical problems, but there ain't nothing wrong with what goes on in the brain. And I finally pointed this out to her. She never forgot it. And she and I have been very good friends. When people had to sneak into my apartment because of the fact that I was trying to start an organization called CALCRA, which is the California Continuing Care Residents Association, an independent residence organization controlled by residents, run by residents, for residents all over the state of California. And we are 20,000 strong. So that is the story of my relationship to Marion. Anytime I'm doing social work here, I'm supposed to be retired, but when people get into trouble, they find their way to my apartment because we do not have an on-staff social worker. You read my article on the misuse of social workers by CCRCs. I think they have done a dreadful thing to our profession. A, a social worker, in order to make a living, has to work for six or eight of these places to make one salary. Now, I know that since retirement, and I use that word guardedly, <laughs> I do not think you know what retirement is in the <laughs> traditional sense. You have uh, developed a passion for, um, and what is the term we should use today? The older No, actually, I, I would say my passion is for justice. Right. Let's be fair, Esther. Right. I'm not asking for anything but justice. I say, if you are selling a product that says to people, we will take care of you for the whole of your life, whatever is left of it, we will give you dignity, we will give you a fair shake, we will try to keep you as independent as possible. This is, all the stuff is written into the law. It's a lovely concept, mm -hmm. but the implementation falls very far short. Did you wish to share your experiences in this area today? Yes, I'm going to share, but it, it, I want everyone to understand that this is not a unique experience. Mm -hmm. As I tell you about my experience, I also want to tell you about my experience as a social worker here, retired. <laughs> but I began to realize I had to fill a gap, a big hole, and I wanted the administration to hire a social worker because you cannot have people facing the loss of mates, catastrophic illness, the loss of faculties, the ability to swallow, the ability to see, the ability to walk, and not have someone that they can talk to. The other residents are simply not interested as they have said to me many, many times, I've got my own troubles. I can't get excited. I have a heart condition. And I, I, I respect that. I came here for peace and quiet. I don't want to raise hell. Well, neither did I. I came here for peace and quiet, too. I came here to retire and write my books, do my research, have a little fun, do some history. I wasn't counting on writing <coughs> who will take care of me when I am old and how will they do it. I, this was not on the horizon. I, was going, to, I would, was going to continue to teach English as a second language to my foreign students because I still have three left. I'm still doing it. A Peruvian student who is studying for her LVN exam, she's Hispanic, and her, the language on the exam is difficult for me, so I can imagine what it is for her. I still have a Vietnamese student who's been with me now for 10 years and a Chinese student who's been with me for 15. And these are people who have become like family because now uh, they feel the need to help the lady who was once very strong and able 
and now is far less strong and probably physically much less able. I have to use a magnifying glass because the print in dictionaries is very small. <laughs> and I use a magnifying glass in my glasses, and then I have to say to my students, what does it say? <laughs> but it works, and they're still able to learn. And I'm doing that, but I'm also trying to help fellow residents because a CCRC is a very complex uh, entity. And can you tell us what a CCRC is? It's a continuing care residential community which offers lifelong care. Now, that's a marvelous concept. If you don't want to be a burden to your family, that's a good concept. And this is why I came here. I didn't come here to die. I came here to live. But when I reached the point where I could no longer take care of myself, I didn't want to shift that burden to my children because they have their own families. Most of them become what is known as the sandwich generation. They've got children and elderly parents, and they are absolutely overwhelmed. And I had to learn the system of the CCRCs over a four-year period. My book, Who Will Take Care of Me When I Am Old and How Will They Do It, is the product of four or five years of diligent reading of the law, diligent studying the system from top to bottom, uh, watching it go to outsourcing as if it was a business and not a social service, the bottom line becoming more and more apparent in the delivery of services, managed care managed to the point where you get the minimum and anything else you need, you have to pay for yourself, which is not made clear. Contracts which are written that any attorney would call an adhesion contract, which means the contract is written to favor the provider and not favor the resident. Therefore, when you take a CCRC to court, usually they will, they will rule in favor of the resident because any judge or any uh, jury quickly understands that contract wasn't written for the resident's benefit. And of course, I have learned a lot about the contract. For example, the idea of a continuum of care sounds attractive, but when people come to a point where they really need care, they are really better off in their own familiar surroundings. Take them out of there. Have them coping with people who barely can speak their language and they can't really communicate who will hand you your dentures unrinsed for you to put in your mouth. And then if you gag on it, and there's an incident like that in the book, they say you should be grateful for any care we give you. Okay? In not quite correct English. Okay? And if you get upset and throw a clock on the floor, <laughs> which can happen if you're pretty angry and you're old, you're tired, and you've just come back from an operation. And then you try to go down to complain to management, and you are stopped on the way by the director of nurses who's supposed to be chastising the person who did this to you. And then you are accused, when you try to get past her into the elevator, of having been abusive or hurt her with your walker, which you can barely stand on because you're only a couple of days out of an operation. This is a real case I'm describing to you, okay? And then this is the kind of thing you can encounter outside of your own milieu, your own home. Now, I've gone on and on. Am, am I off the track? I think you're on the track. This, no. is, this is the passion. This is what you talked about at the, the reception last night. That's correct. 
Hall of Distinction. Yes. And and maybe you could talk a little bit about what you feel should be done in this area. Well, w the the thing, the most important thing that has to be done is that people have to understand the product they are buying. Your care is as good as the administrator in charge. Anyone can be an administrator, an executive director in one of these places. There are people who have had police work background, ministerial, you know, a clergy, uh, uh, people who are accountants, people who are, uh, all they have to do is get themselves a course, a, you know, a gerontology certificate. Uh, a vice president for operations here who is no longer with us uh, got a certificate. He was a literature major. He wrote like an angel. But he did on-the-job training. Well, while he was doing his training, he turned out to be a pretty good administrator. But, but when I needed to see him about my own problem, I had to force my way into his office. And he said to me, this is the vice president for operations, he said to me, I have very little to do with the residents. And you have to go through channels. Well, I'd already been through the channels. I talked to the executive director. I'd even gone up to the CEO. And the answer was, Mrs. Hyatt, you're not happy. Maybe you should be leaving. Well, that's a very interesting choice. I had already put in a quarter of a million dollars. This was my home. I should leave because I'm not happy because a service that was promised under the law and in my contract and my doctors had prescribed was not going to be given to me. And my choice was to leave my apartment and go to the health center and leave them with a $300,000 apartment to sell, which is quite lovely. You've had the tour. And say quietly, oh, yes, I need pureed food now. It is not rocket science that an old lady might need pureed food somewhere along the line. I had no social worker come to visit me. The swallowing disorder is called cricopharyngeal spasms. It's a very fancy name for a rather nasty disease. What happens when you eat is that this sphincter no longer works properly on the autonomic nervous system, but can seize up. And if it seizes up around something hard, your history. That's anxiety producing in anybody. Here, not a social worker spoke to me. I had to snag the director of nurses, make her come to my apartment, and she duly reported this, which, to her credit, she also sent a memo to the administration and to the food service outsourced, again, to a for-profit company, and their bottom line is profit, not service. Their people are not trained to work with the elderly. They get a superficial kind of training so that they in the dining room can watch if there's any aberrant behavior they can report to administration. They are supposed to fulfill things like for diabetics. They do that pretty well because that's pretty pro forma. Anything out of the ordinary becomes an issue and their, their director of the dining service has said, well, you get a housekeeper to help you, or you get someone to puree your food, and that's fine. And I said, but I'm already paying for that service, and I don't want it. So the administration let me swing in the wind. I brought in an ombudsman, and then after the ombudsman, and he had written a letter saying, this woman does not require a higher level of care because she doesn't need any help with the activities of daily living. She needs pureed food in her apartment. And they ignored the letter for a very simple reason. The ombudsman has no enforcement powers. The ombudsman and I became very good friends. He was my first teacher, helped me with my first research on my book, and he is still the ombudsman. <laughs> And once we had lunch together, and the staff came by and they said, is anything wrong? And he said, no, Lily and I are collaborating on a book. <laughs> and another administration person came up, anything wrong? <laughs> 
And of course, that was rather funny. Yeah. But the point is, I've kept my sense of humor if nobody has noticed, when I could have really had a nervous breakdown over this. I mean, we're joking about it now. It wasn't funny then. I actually had been misdiagnosed with myasthenia gravis, which of course is a death sentence, which means total paralysis finally of all. Uh, of the, uh, it was turned out to be a misdiagnosis by the best neurologist in San Francisco. No social worker to talk to, to explain, you know, I was still struggling. And while I was struggling with this problem, my doctor had said she needs pureed food. That much they knew. He did not know what the problem was. And by accident, I found a doctor who specialized in swallowing disorders. I went through a series of tests, and they identified this rather weird, but I, I understand not terribly uncommon problem. But this is where the system failed. Now, the nurse did what she was supposed to do. She reported it. She asked the administration to go forward. Their answer was to let me swing in the wind and I haven't showed you my kitchen as yet, but that was complete. I had to spend another $1,500 so that I could puree my food for one year. Sometimes I was too tired to eat. Now, they then pronounced an edict that I could only take up one chicken breast at a time, which meant I would have to do this every night. And I said, I'm sure that if I had to do it each night, and you, they don't always have chicken breasts. I can't eat everything. I can only eat chicken or salmon. That's it. I mean, the other things don't pure up, puree up in a way that I can swallow. I had to fight every inch of the way, both the Morrison Food Company, which was the outsourced uh, food group. They are very good at the restaurant business, much less good depending on the supervisor that they send in. We had an executive chef that couldn't, had a hip problem, couldn't walk into the kitchen, certainly wasn't going to do any extra work for me. And they fought me and fought me, and I had to get a lawyer, and after $3,000 and a year of agony, they settled the suit just before we were going to an open situation with an arbitration, which would have made this public information. This is really the bottom line. They folded. I now get my pureed food in my apartment. I still have a lot of work to do, which I do. I put the dinners together and I freeze them. So that is how I live. I have to ripen my own fruit because the fruit on the buffet is too hard for me to swallow. It's not quite ripe. And that's the, that's the reality, and other people are able to manage. This does not mean to say that some people do not get good care. The truth is that some people survive the system, and some people have even benefited from it. But usually they are people who are very vocal in support of the administration. My administration, right or wrong. And I be got the name of Grouser for complaining. The councils, which is supposed to represent the residents, unfortunately, are packed usually, unwittingly or wittingly, with administration supporters. So the person who has a legitimate complaint is made to feel, don't say that. It's, I always laughed and said it was like the mafia, omerta, silence. <laughs> you keep your mouth shut. If you're having a problem, nobody's interested, not the other residents, certainly, because most people, as they age, do become much more inward, much less, I, as they would say, I have my own problems. I don't need to hear yours, which is true. But I'm the exception that proves the rule, of course, because I am ready to listen to anyone's problem, and then I try to find a solution. Last night, and in our previous discussions, I have two questions for you. One, you have some very strong opinions about social workers in um, CCRC facilities. Correct. And the other is, 
uh, in the aging process that the services and the attention that we pay today is primarily to those with serious problems, um, dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional issues, uh, alcoholism, addictions, uh, severe health problems. Or abused children, which is legitimate. Yes. However, because you are, you have saved your retirement, you know, I've been through every hardship of my generation. It's not just me. We lived through a depression. We lived through several wars. You know, I, I don't want to recount. Starting with World War II, when I was all of 14, that was the beginning. And uh, we are in one in Iraq now, and a Korean War, and a Vietnam War, and all of the attendant things with that. I feel I've paid my dues. I've raised two families and numerous other people's children, and I have educated myself. I have given service to the community. I'm entitled to dignity and peace at the end of my life and respect. And I was called a liar for speaking out and when uh, Jan Lee said it well, the, chapter, uh, the executive director of the California chapter for National Association of Social Work, he said they were going to shut me up. I have a recent letter from their attorney asking me to cease and desist my writing columns, a book, and all that, because it was not comfortable. I was telling truth to power. I guess that's what you call it today. <laughs> tyranny is tyranny. And even if you do it to a woman who has saved enough to make a decent retirement, or you do it to a man who has been an executive and you start treating him like a very small child, you know, this is the sort of thing that has to stop. And what we need to stop it is not the young social workers who cannot really begin to comprehend what an aging person lives through. And if you even manage to keep your sense of humor and your sense of balance and you understand this is part of the downside or the flip side of being becoming old, and if you wanted to avoid this, you went when you were young and beautiful and not when you were old and crumbling. <laughs> But anyway, to say, I still believe that if you, in good faith, pay a great deal of money, you have a right to the same uh, privilege you have when you buy a bad product at Macy's, you can return it and get some kind of rec recompense. Here, there is no place to return the product. Therefore, we need people on guard constantly. I want older social workers to retrain, not the, not the training they received to work through other systems and with other populations, but to really retrain and not in the schools of gerontology. It's a whole different cup of tea. Social work probably should take in the gerontology people, and there should be some kind of blending. I happen to be working with a medical anthropologist now who is doing her doctoral dissertation on continuing care residential communities. And I have tried to explain, and even these people who are aware, a medical anthropologist is aware of cultures. And uh, we were talking about something one day, and she said, well, I'll make the call. I said, no, you won't. I said, I will make the call. I want the people at the bank to know that they're dealing with me and not an intermediary or a spokesman or an advocate for me. I'm not at that stage yet. And this is what the social workers have to learn. Don't case manage. Find out what the strengths are of this person <coughs> And what that person can do, and whatever that person can do, however haltingly, however slowly, you wait your patient and let them do it. And this is the basic change in the training. And 
I am looking for social workers who have left bureaucratic positions where they are loaded with paperwork, where they have an enormous amount of work to do just to get through the day with a caseload that is unmanageable. You would have 360 folks to deal with in a place of this size, and most places that are smaller are not viable. And you are also dealing with an extremely accomplished um, group of people who have owned businesses, started banks, who have been in the world and were successful. They're an interesting group. If you manage to find out what they are as people and know what their capabilities were and are, we have had many doctors here who have been in my facility, and I know there must be in others, and lawyers, and people who really were movers and shakers in their day in the community, and they do decline. This is inevitable. But make sure that they are respected and that they don't have to run out into the hall stark naked looking for help in the, in the health center. I know that among your recent activities, you've been actively involved with uh, PARP, <coughs> the American Association of Retired Persons. That happened by a fluke. I was actually uh, doing some testimony for the Human Services Committee in the Senate, I believe it was, and then I went back to the Assembly, and in the room was um, part of the volunteer system of ARP. And uh, she heard me testify, and you know, you're allowed two minutes. And she gave me her card, and she said, I want to talk to you some more. And we began a telephone conversation. I began to send her my columns. And she, she began to speak to the advocacy manager of ARP, who happens to be Casey Young. He's still in that position. He was there last night. Did you meet him? No, I did not. He was there with his wife and came from Sacramento, which was a nice tribute. But Casey created a position for me. He wanted a panel of experts, but apparently, who were older people who knew their field, but apparently I filled the bill and I was the first. And I now have a title of policy specialist. And for a couple of years, I was policy advisor on continuing care residential communities. And of course, they have given attorneys to people who have been fighting <coughs> cases in places like this uh, under the Americans for Disabilities Act and Fair Housing when they didn't want to leave their apartments to go into skilled nursing or assisted living. They wanted to stay in their homes, and I'm a great advocate of that. And you, if you really start to pay for that, it can amount to plus your initial fee, your entrance fee, plus your monthly care fee. It can amount to $13,000 a month for around-the-clock care. You add that one up. How are, are we doing for time? We have uh, 20, minutes. 20, 20 minutes. minutes. But you know, dear, can you stop the camera? I've got to get Wait. Or the books that you would like to write? Well, uh, they have nothing to do with social work, so <laughs> I think we'll skip that one. <laughs> but I think maybe the message is that uh, you are vital, you are alive, you are alert, you are interested in many things, that as you're aging, it does not mean that I'm out of touch with the world. No. Uh, not only am I not out of touch with the world, but you know, I'm still very aware of what's going on in the Middle East. This, uh, this much I will tell you. I am working on campuses to develop writers. Uh, right now, there is a program that I have funded and have encouraged students to get involved in, particularly the people in journalism and literature and uh, any of the media fields. And I want them to be aware that we have to develop critical thinking so that we can understand the complex issues in the Middle East. They are not easy to solve. 
We have to be sensitive to other cultures. At the same time, we don't want to lose our own. And I want to develop a group of writers on campuses all over uh, where there would be a Muslim student, uh, a Jewish student, various Christian faith students sitting together in a small group to write about and talk about how we can keep the poison from the Middle East from invading our campuses. We at least can have a civil dialogue. We at least have a framework where people are educated to be critical thinkers. And our hope lies with the young people who are developing and they have to be exposed to the writers, other writers, to other thinkers in that field. And you are right, I am very much in touch with the world. But they come to me now, I don't go to them. I can't walk around a campus without help, as you found out. When you are blind and when you are <laughs> hardly able to walk, you do need help. But that doesn't mean you stop thinking and stop creating, as a matter of fact. And stop contributing. Well, I, I guess so. You might say that's important too. Yes, you have to contribute not only money. The only people that are honored around in a CCRC are the people who give money. But once they have given that money, uh, that is the end of their usefulness, unfortunately. And these are the people that appear in the publications, that go out to the general public. This person gave this much of a legacy and this much of, or bought this gift annuity, and we are constantly being bombarded for money. And my contribution is not considered a very useful contribution <laughs> by administration, I'm sorry to say. The residents do feel slightly differently. <laughs> And I think they usually don't contact me because of the fact that I was marginalized. Uh, I w the residents were made to feel if they associated with me, they would not be in favor with the administration. I was really isolated for a very long time. When I started the California Advocate, uh, the California uh, Residents Association, Continuing Care Residents Association here, I had a meeting with two of the top officers who happened to be a resident in another CCRC down the way and uh, who came here to talk to a few of the people here and they had to sneak into my apartment. That was before SB 244 was passed and there there was a clause there that said we can form independent residence associations. Uh, they don't duplicate the work of the councils, which are basically involved with in-house activities that need attention. But they do focus on larger issues like residence rights, residence health and welfare, I mean, speaking generally, there are 20,000 of us and there are going to be more. So this is very important that both organizations, both the council and the, uh, the uh, res independent residents association. For example, I will tell you, uh, there, there are things reported, for example, in the publication of the minutes of the um, independent residents association, which never see the light of day in the minutes of our council meetings. They are carefully controlled. At one point, residents couldn't speak at all at council meetings. And then they had to submit questions in advance, which were going to be screened and decided upon whether they're going to be even allowed on the floor. And then they had three minutes to present complex issues. I have never availed myself of that uh, particular uh, lovely extension of my rights because I cannot articulate the complex issues that are involved in this kind of a, an organization 
or institution in three minutes. I just can't do it. And also, when you do get up at a council meeting and you try to do that, everyone says, sit down, sit down, that's not important. They usually are speaking out of ignorance. And I don't get upset about that, but neither do I expose myself to it. But now you have, over time, used your past expertise and your skill in the field of writing. And most recently, you have uh, become a regular uh, feature article writer for the uh, California NASW California News. Uh, would you care to comment on that? That also happened by accident. It started with the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. I went to see Pat McGinnis, who founded that organization. That is an advocacy organization for elders. And they were only interested in nursing homes for the really vulnerable, very ill people. And I came to them and said, there's a whole area you're not even looking at. And that is the continuing care residential communities. These are able people who come in healthy and who plan to get care for the rest of their lives. And I told Pat McGinnis my story, and Pat came here to see me. And I said, I want to have a regular column where I discuss these issues, and it is called the CCRC Corner. I did that for about a year, and one day I said, you know, this is silly. Why am I not writing for the California News? Why am I not writing for my own profession? They're the only ones that can help. So what I did was I wrote a piece. It was an op-ed piece. And what the op-ed piece said, CCRCs where social workers ought to be. That was my first piece in September of 2004. This is now 2007. Yes, it's nearly three years ago. And I sent it to the, edit the then editor who passed away. And Jan Lee referred to this, uh, the chapter executive director had to f get that issue out, and that's how we met. And I absolutely, when it comes to computers, I can use them for word processing, period. So all of my copy is done on an old Apple that deserves retirement from 1995, and I send hard copy in. Everybody else is doing it by email. And I was fearful also of going on the internet because I was being monitored carefully. And I felt what I wanted to write had to go to the editor and into publication before it was excised. The, actually, the CEO here went to Sacramento and spoke to legislators about me and gave them to understand that nothing I said could be believed. And I think she went even further than that. I got letters from those legislators. They were boiling mad because unfortunately, unfortunately, they knew me. And they knew I can only do one thing. I can only speak the truth. And you know what they did to the old Hebrew prophets. They were not exactly the most popular guys in town. The truth, the, the person who speaks truth to power takes enormous risks. And I figured I was fully amortized and I'm entitled to take any risk I please now. So I did. <laughs> but everything goes hard copy. And you won't believe it, but I'm on deadline for the canner <laughs> advocate. <laughs> and it, that's how Jan Lee and I met. And Hank Lawson, who is my present editor at the California News, inherited me. And his first thing he said was, you mean you're not sending it to me on the internet? I said, no, I don't know how. And every so often I say, how are you doing? He said, you're the only one who does it that way, but I manage it. <laughs> and he and I never met until last night. But I feel, you see that bunch of flowers on your left? That came from the young people at Canner, who is 
part of my extended family. And Maisha Jackson, who was my first editor at Canner, actually works for Daryl Steinberg, who was running the bill that I am now lobbying for and writing about, 489, which pertains to the closures of these places. If you can believe this, there are 10 pages of legislation on how to open these places and not one line on what happens to residents when they close. We are completely on our own. Marguerite Terrace closed last year. Everybody was scattered to the four winds. They were given an option of moving out to a place in Los Angeles from San Jose that you leave your family, your friends, your doctors, your dentists, everybody behind <coughs> for the convenience of the administration. They are then able to take a $5 million property or more and sell it, and they come out smelling like a rose. And they transferred 16 people from the uh, health center, so-called, skilled nursing, four of them died. And I wrote a column on that, and of course I lobby for that bill. I'm working on that now. And I don't even leave the apartment. When I call people and say that I work for AARP, the California News run by the NASW, and I work for Canner, uh, you know, at Canner, of course, sued the Department of Health Services for not doing proper inspections. The inspections can't be done properly, and the oversight can't be done properly because the oversight groups do not have enough money. And what's interesting is the contracts branch, which is supposed to sit, oversee the money for here, can you oversee 78 or 79 CCRCs with five and a half people all over the state? And if you don't get a penny of tax money and you get the residents' money through the providers, because that is the way our contracts branch of the Department of Social Services is run. So you have nobody to turn to except the media, and that is why I write the columns. I've written the book, and I will continue to speak at any forum given to me. Social workers, you have to retread, retrain, and come to these places, and they must give you a job. They say it's a frill. They say it costs too much, but they're going to build a bistro here to attract the next generation of baby boomers, and they can't afford a social worker, which is less than you pay for a middle management administrator, maybe $80,000 a year with a whole package. Every social worker that comes, worker that does come has to be an advocate. Even though their salary is paid, it's paid with our money. There is no source of revenue but our money. So they are really working, or should be working, only for residents. If they go into a care plan to move somebody out of their apartment, they are sitting there as the advocate for the uh, resident, not for the administration. The deal now is you have a part-time social worker who comes in, who doesn't know the resident, who's done a quick study of the business, gets all her information or his information secondhand from the administration, and the person who's sitting there is not represented at all. And so what I'm saying is that this system, it's a good system, but the implementation, it's the same thing. Like any good idea, I heard that last night over and over from the older social workers who know their business. You can't, you can't have anything done properly unless it's implemented properly, okay? Including the war in Iraq. <laughs> I believe I've run out of time. Professor Hyatt, I want to thank you very much. 
and again congratulate you on your uh, induction into the Hall of Distinction, the ceremony of which took place last night. I felt so. very humble there, dear. I was a, I am a Johnny come lately. Those people are real veterans. <laughs> I've just, I'm, I, I'm still learning my craft. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome.